Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzle loading. And this is an original John Donaghy Dutch percussion shoots and target rifle. My introduction as a young boy to muzzle loading was muzzle loader target shooting. And because of that, the shoots in style and, and European and really any target rifles, but particularly the shoots in style rifles have always had a near and dear place in my heart just because of how cool they are. These are some of the first specially built race cars of muzzleloading. These weren't frontier pieces. These weren't hunting pieces. They weren't display pieces. These were designed to be target shooting machines. And I've always loved that. If you want to talk about great sports, target shooting is where it's at, in my opinion. I don't really care what you're shooting, but if you're shooting muzzleloaders, target shooting you got an A plus from me. So when I saw this coming up here at the Rock Island Auction Company, I just had to get it down to take a look at it because it's just neat. There are tons of other shoots and rifles out there, but I'm excited to show you this one here today. Target rifles in a contemporary sense and a 21st century sense have all but lost the artistry, I'd say. Many of them are just designed to be mechanical machines to do their job and do it well. But at the beginning, and, and some of the first steps of target shooting, we combined the artistry of arms making for the period with the purpose-built machine. And that's what we have here. Starting at the rear, you'll notice we have a large iron butt plate with this long tail hook here at the end. Now, this is really an odd looking rifle if you've not seen these before, but if you ever have an opportunity to shoulder, especially a European target rifle in the shoots and style, you're under, you will understand very quickly why it's shaped the way it is. Because when you shoulder this, just to give you an example here, when you shoulder this, you wear the gun. You're not holding the gun up, really. You are wearing this. And this iron hook back here, you can see, just tucks in underneath my arm there, and my arm can kind of rest on it there. And I can kind of hold this here. And then when I get into it here, when I get into the rifle, my cheek rests in the cheek well, and my eyes are directly lined up looking down the sights here. This ornate butt plate is held on with two screws. We have one here at the top peak and another about midway down on this plate. I want to note too here on the top crest of our butt plate, we have some beautiful scroll and floral pattern engraving lining up with a lot of the fine European engraving that we see, especially in the mid 19th century. As we come forward on our lock site, you can see the beautiful figure in this wood stock. It's just gorgeous. And I think uh, apart from the stylistic choices of not having a patch box because it's not needed on a piece like this, I think I'm, I'm glad to see that we've left this open up in this region because we get to see so much of that figure. There's not even really any carving back here in the buttstock. It's just left to be nice and plain. Coming forward though, as we get into our wrist, we start to see the main focus of this piece being the, the wrist and the lock area where the action happens. This is where the shooter is and this is where the gun does its work and we see that reflected in the craftsmanship and how it's applied to the piece. As we come through our wrist here you'll notice we have some beautiful scroll carving and then some checkering throughout the wrist here so that we get a nice comfortable grip on the stock and if you're even sweating during a match you're getting a little bit of airflow through that checkering which is neat to see. And we see that on other arms for the period but once we start to get into the mid 19th century, especially with these high end target arms, um, we really start to see that checkering shrink and be really detailed and really fine, like you'd expect to see on some of the English pieces from the same period. As we come forward of that wrist area, we start to see our large shoots and style trigger guard here. This trigger guard is interesting to me because we have a palm rest here at the front when I shouldered it earlier. I, was, I had my hand up here on the barrel, but we have this large cast trigger guard here 
with the palm rest. It's a really heavy iron trigger guard on this, I think, to contribute to the weight and the ability to hold this piece for long periods of time. Something interesting about this trigger guard, you'll note we have a large knob back here at the base of the trigger guard, and we have a hinge up here. <laughs> kind of odd, and uh, when we unscrew this knob back here, we get access to our trigger plate for a trigger adjustment as needed. And I think possibly too, you could replace the trigger guard as needed depending on the target shooter that was shooting it. Because these shoots and rifles are so compact and so designed for your shooter to be comfortable for that shooter to shoot as precisely as they can, I think it's understandable that depending on the shooter that was shooting this, you'd need to adjust the trigger guard itself. So this one, you have the ability to totally swap it out if you need to down the road. But I think probably a first adjustment or the first reason for this knob here at the rear to swing the trigger guard forward is gonna to be to adjust our triggers, to refine them, to get as light of a trigger as possible. Circling around now to the upper part of our stock here, we have a long tang it comes from our bolster back here, kind of our breech area, all the way back to this established crest here, which when you saw me shouldering this piece, your face is real snug in here. You don't have a lot of place to go, and that's gonna help you keep your target in, in your sights and help with your follow through a little bit because you don't have, when you're, when you're compact like this, you can't go anywhere. When I mean, you're gonna have some recoil, even with a light charge, out of something like this, that you're keeping everything close and tight to keep it stiff. At least that's how I think about it. On top of our tang here, we have beautifully executed scroll and floral pattern engraving once again. Our rear screw is engraved and its color does match the rest of the tang. Our front screw though is larger it's a bit of a lighter color and it does not have any of the scroll engraving like we see on our rear screw back here. Forward of our rear tang screw here, we have our adjustable rear peep sight here, which I just want to make a note of because even though we're still in the muzzle loading era, this isn't the first time that we see peep sights and globe sights being utilized but we do see the application of what we consider now to be more of target-oriented sights rather early in the muzzleloading period, especially once we get through the 1800s. Once we get past kind of the 1812 era, and there's some examples of that before, but we start to see the application of these more precise sights being used, and we see them all the way through even today. Um, so I just want to note how neat this is to see on a piece like this. It's very common on a Schutzen style rifle to have a peep and a globe front sight set up on here because of the precision that you were going for while still in the muzzle loading era. So the sight can be adjusted uh, left and right dependent on your windage or depending on your shooter, however you want to think about that. We have some adjustment up here at the front and this entire assembly could be swapped with another rear assembly as needed uh, because it's just bolted into the tang here. Now it's not complete in this piece, but we would have um, a disc or something back here. We, it's not included in this piece as we're looking at it today, but we would have the disc that would apply the peep aspect to this site. And what that peep is gonna do it's gonna limit what you can see. And there'd be a hole in the center of that peep for those of you unfamiliar. And those holes would change depending on the disc. So you can have a small hole or a gradually larger hole depending on the disc that you applied to the site to match what was comfortable for you as the target shooter. And that goes to the same for today for many peep sites or many target sites are gonna be out there. Again, when it comes to target shooting, Muzzle loading did it first and they did it with some incredible class, I think. As we come forward here, we have a rather large and, and rather um, stocky lock set up here. But again, we have a refined weight to that. This isn't big just to be big. This is weight for purpose. This is weight to absorb recoil and to be 
mechanically sound shot after shot after shot. Matching the engraving and the carving that we see on the rest of the piece, our lock plate face is just beautifully engraved. We have a scroll in the center of our lock plate here with the maker's name in the same presentation that we see forward here in this section on the top of our barrel, an inch and a half or so forward of our breech and our bolster assembly here. As we come forward of our lock here, we don't have a whole lot in regards to decoration. Most of the decoration is kept to the rear of this piece. We have a large, what I would consider, and many of you might consider today in your target rifles, to be a bull barrel on this piece. It is a 45 caliber. The barrel itself measures 30 and one half inch long, and it has a solid rib along the top here, which I think is neat. So um, even though we don't have what would later be uh, scope rings and, and optic mounts applied here, we have a similar rib running the length of this barrel to accommodate a, a more precise target system, which I think is just neat. Apart from the rib, we have a round barrel all the way around. And with my ruler here, we are an inch and a quarter wide from side to side. So again, a very heavy barrel, despite the somewhat small caliber. I mean, it's 45 is starting to be small caliber. This isn't like a 32 caliber target rifle. So it is rather large still. We have two barrel keys in the stock as we move forward here to our four stock and they have matching what I believe to be iron or really darkened brass um, extension plates on either side, kind of protecting that stock space as it goes through. Being a, a mid 19th century gun and being kind of a higher end target style rifle, it makes sense to want to have an easily replaceable barrel. Um, and you know, depending on the maker, and how he was set up, you could have had other sized or other caliber drop-in barrels for this same stock assembly to practice different things. That's something that we begin to see in the 19th century and as target shooting begins to evolve out of muzzleloading in general. At the front of our four stock, we do have a nose cap. We do have a bit of a fracture in it up here at the front, but underneath we have a large metal ramrod What's interesting about this, I think, we're just gonna remove it here shortly. This ramrod also serves as a drop tube for your powder. So if you are really into muzzleloader target shooting or even black powder cartridge target shooting, you have people that are looking for precision with their black powder or their muzzleloaders and they will load their powder with a drop tube. And this drop tube allows you so drop your tube into the bore and you can pour your powder charge all the way down and you know that the powder is going to end up at the breech or at the base of your barrel. And we see that even being applied here in this mid 19th century target rifle piece. Now this is a brass drop tube, so we can assume that there is strength there, but I don't know that this is the tube or the rod that would have been used to load the projectile. Being a tube it doesn't have the strength that a solid rod would, and presumably, based on contemporary muzzleloader target shooting, your projectile and any wadding or padding around it would be very tight. And I think you would want, even in the mid-19th century here, you would want a solid rod of some kind to load that ultra-tight charge seeking precision accuracy like we can assume that they would have with a rifle such as this. At the front of the muzzle here, we have another inlaid gold band matching the same gold bands that we have back here at the tail end of the barrel and the front end of our breech. We have our enclosed sight here at the front with a simple pin post in the front, um, just a neat Precision sight picture, it's something very familiar to me uh, and what I grew up with, and it's neat to see it on an old piece like this. Flipping around to our side plate side now, you can see the complete end of our nose cap here, and then you can see the other side of our barrel keys, kind of the working end really, where you would remove them from this side. Note that they're going from left to right. You would remove them from this side 
to clean or maintain your barrel as needed. Now, as we come back here, I wanna note we have a small refined divot in the top of the stock here. When shouldering this piece, um, if you choose to not use the palm rest down here, you can kind of line your thumb up in this notch and my sized thumb fits well in this notch. Um, so this could be just, you know, assumptions here um, or speculation. This could be a place to mark a, a handhold for the shooter, or it could just be that at some point in time, uh, the stock was damaged and it was cleaned up and repaired here just by swelling that down a little bit. Again, that's speculation, not at all discrediting the quality of the piece. But on a, a piece like this, on a muzzleloader like this, it would have been cared for quite a bit. Um, I think it's rare that we see something done to it that wasn't purposeful, apart from you know, the, the damage on, on the forend cap and things. And we do have a little notch back here in the end grain of our cheek piece. Those do seem accidental. Uh, this here does not. Coming back, we have our side plate mortise. You'll notice we don't have any hardware at all on this face, not even lock bolt screws. So there's something going on internally here to fixate the lock to the stock and the barrel that doesn't involve a bolt going through um, the other side of the stock here. And then as we get back here again, back to the action area of the firearm in general, we have beautiful carving and checkering here on this side. And we get to a rather extreme cheek rest here in the cheek piece area of the stock. This comes out quite a distance from the rest of the stock. Uh, apart from any cast off or anything that you might see in other pieces, this piece makes up for uh, that comfort and that tuning to the shooter is by having this protrusion of wood coming off in a leftwards direction out of the stock. And then underneath the cheek piece coming about halfway here, we have that continued scroll and checkered carving in the stock. Then like we see in many muzzle loaders, especially in the period, we do have a space back here for some more carving in the stock. Unlike a lot of the American carving that we see here, where we have the entire butt area of the stock being used as a canvas for carving, our composition stays to the upper half of this stock back here, well away from the shoulder where it could possibly apply some discomfort. But we just kind of have a square or a circular space up here coming off of our cheek rest. Notice that the cheek rest line lines up very closely, if you drew an imaginary line from here to our butt plate, back to the point of our butt plate here. That's something to consider when studying or, or looking to recreate kind of a unique piece like these shoots and target rifles, is a lot of this geometry is figured out to be comfortable and to work with the shooter's body. And we see that here when we start connecting some of those lines through the composition of the piece. Like I said at the beginning, muzzleloader target shooting has a near and dear place in my heart, and it's always neat to have an opportunity to look at an original piece, you know, one of the granddaddies really, of target shooting in general. I mean, if you enjoy target shooting now, in a modern sense, with a modern firearm of some kind, this is the kind of thing that spawned that and started that. Uh, you know, it's kind of neat. And uh, just another neat little avenue of muzzleloading that's out there. There's so many interesting things about muzzleloading as we go through history. And the origin of target sports and shooting sports is definitely one of them. I'd like to thank the Rock Island Auction Company for giving me the opportunity to show you this neat piece here today. If you'd like to see more high quality photos and videos of more original pieces like this one, check out the Rock Island Auction Company social media pages. Once again, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time.